My name is, uh, I'll, I'll go by Tomas this morning, uh, <laughs> Tomas Frater. I'm uh, American born uh, of Hungarian heritage. I was here about 30 years ago investing in private equity and industry. Uh, came back um, about five years ago to the region, Vienna and Budapest, um, focused exclusively on real estate for the past five years, working uh, with Starwood Capital, trying to deploy more capital into the region. And uh, now I currently advise um, public companies such as Immo Finance and others in the region looking at um, different growth and expansion opportunities. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Tom. Thomas Szyszewski. I'm uh, with TriGranite. Uh, for about seven months. Uh, previously, I was uh, in uh, Scandinavia working for a real estate uh, retail REIT, with very interesting dynamics now happening in Northern Europe. And then before that, I was a tracker for 12 years. I've been with the company since it's uh, since the mid uh, 2000s when uh, we entered into uh, Poland. And uh, primarily a uh, shopping center developer. Last few years, for obvious reasons, uh, focusing more on uh, offices run by a private equity group, um, and the company's gone through various uh, ownership changes in the last five years or so. Great, Luke. Good morning. Uh, my name's Luke Dawson. I'm Regional Managing Director and Head of Capital Markets for Callers International. Uh, I've been in the region since 2007. Uh, I've been based in Prague, I've been based in Belgrade, uh, and now back in Prague. So I'm overseeing uh, the capital markets teams across the region for the last three years. And um, uh, we'll get into it when we get on the panel, but I think our focus is, as agencies at this point is more finding the connection between supply and demand, as Kevin pointed out. So I think that that's gonna be a big part of the conversation today. Hi, I'm Noah Steinberg um, from Wing. Uh, Wing is uh, a large privately held uh, property developer and investor here in Hungary. We're present in all segments of the market. Um, perhaps our, our absolute core competence is office development. Uh, we're conveniently located directly all across the river from one of our newest uh, uh, newest project, which is the Evosoft headquarters building, which is being built next to the uh, Ericsson building. Um, it's actually a good perspective to get from here. I like that. Um, but we're active in, in residential, in hotels, in retail, and industrial. Um, we also, uh, as I think was mentioned at the end of last year, acquired a majority stake in uh, Echo Invest, which is the uh, largest uh, developer in Poland, uh, which gives us a very strong regional footprint, and we're excited to continue working on that. Great. Thanks. Good morning, my name is Anaida. I've been working on the market for about 17 years in different functions uh, with different companies. Uh, I joined Consider about two years ago as partner. My partner founded it, which is an investment, privately owned boutique investment advisory, mainly banking financing for SMEs in the region, but with a focus on Poland and Hungary 11 years ago. I'm adding the real estate arm. We have mainly private sale and buy side mandates for small cap investments, various asset classes, mainly again in Hungary and Poland. Uh, we have a partner in Poland and our assignments are such as um, uh, hotel development, uh, land for sale, um, some uh, residential. I have a client seeking 300 units for a hotel, um, hotel type, uh, hospitality operation. And we also do uh, try to secure financing for small clients and match basically um, financing needs and sale needs for private um, owners with foreign owners, investors. Great. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to, just to pick up, maybe, maybe let's, let's start with you, Tom. Um, j just in some of some of the, the bigger trends that were picked up a little bit in, um, in the presentation there, um, what's your sense of, um, when you're looking at this region particularly, um, how some of those big trends that are happening more broadly um, in terms of the real estate side are influencing particularly um, Hungary, but the, but the region? mentioned my introduction, um, we're, we're primarily a shopping center developer, uh, mixed use, focus on shopping center. That, that development business is, is, I don't want to say gone, but uh, very limited. Um, so not just us, but many of the, the, our, our competitors and partners that were developing shopping centers changing their strategies to focusing more on office and, and residential as well. Some have gone into logistics. Um, so, something that was our bread and butter, uh, that part of the business has, has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, but other asset classes have, have become, uh, uh, have actually come on the radar that haven't been non-existent here. So, student housing, um, um, residential to rent, um, 
you know, not to the extent here in Hungary as in Poland, but it's, it's become quite popular now. So you have some um, uh, institutional money finally looking at that asset class and, and you know, we hope to be part of it as well. It was a large acquisition by a, a German uh, fund, TAG, that bought a, a Polish developer looking at developing eight to 10,000 units for rent in Poland, where historically it's been uh, privately owned and uh, as an investment by, by, by families. Now, finally, it seems that there's traction taken at institutional level. Um, ha we don't see that here yet, but uh, definitely, you know, it's, it's coming from, from the West and North, and uh, we hope to be uh, kind of, you know, get in on that from a development angle as well. Okay. I mean, obviously here you can see construction happening there, you've got the Millennium Gardens happening here, um, and just when I go to Warsaw, the same feeling that you get that there's a lot of activity. It's a vibrant place in terms of um, the real estate side. Um, and, and look, just, just picking up that point there from Tom, I mean, there's, in, in Poland, for sure, there's been a lot more activity in the, in the sort of student housing and also in the residential side. Is that a trend that you're also seeing coming to here, more interest from international capital looking at that area? Yeah, I'd say definitely. I mean, if, if you look at uh, student housing in particular is, a, is different and I think it'll continue to be viewed differently than BTR sector because student housing is much more an operating business that's more intensive and you need, I think, a, a little bit more of a platform than the BTR side. And as our region continues to develop, I think those two will, will continue to kind of separate themselves. But we have seen a lot of international capital. I mean, we were involved in a transaction where we had Kojima, a Japanese group buy into, um, I think, the largest platform in Poland called Student Depot, um, and that was last year, and that's pure international capital. That was their first investment into Poland um, with the idea of building that out into a larger platform. I think what we'll see in terms of, of foreign capital is it will be foreign capital that will drive it. I don't think they're going to be doing individual developments and assets. They, they, they want to step in either to a platform, they want to step into something where you've got several hundred or even a thousand rooms of, of student housing, which we don't have in the region yet. So it's a bit of a, a chicken in the egg of you'll see the international capital come in when they can step into a considerable sized investment. And right now, Poland's the only market that has that. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to pick up with you, um, Thomas. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that you'd also been in, um, you've been in Asia, you've come from the US, you've then returned from Asia. Um, looked back at this market. I mean, j just from your perspective, I suppose, what have you seen as some of the changes and where do you see everything heading at the moment just in terms of those, those bigger, wider trends that you've seen? A lot's changed. Um, I was walking here or coming from um, public transportation this morning and um, this didn't exist when I was in Hungary 30 years ago and we were investing, as I said, in industry. Uh, we took an uh, industry and consolidated it and took it public here in, in Budapest. Um, but there was not nearly the activity, particularly on the real estate side, um, back then as there is now. So, you know, uh, hats off to guys like Noah and others, um, Tri Granite and others who are, who've done tremendous work in building um, this city and the country up. Um, size matters. And um, I think what was mentioned about, let's say, markets like Poland, it's a big market. It's an IPRA indexed market. It's attractive to institutional capital. They're flowing capital into that market because it has size and it, it has stability. Uh, despite the fear of, you know, everyone two years ago was saying Warsaw is being um, overbuilt, well, it's absorbing uh, a lot of that volume, so it's pretty impressive growth there. Um, it does matter in terms of um, deploying larger checks. Um, our guys, um, let's say guys like Starwood Capital, uh, want to put a minimum 35, 40 million of equity to work when they look at a project, so we're talking over 100 million. Um, you, euros in a single investment. So uh, it is important to have some size and scale. Um, Poland has that. I think Hungary is developing more of that going forward. Um, but you know, I'm encouraged uh, when I look at the short term of what I've seen and I think what we have here in the region, um, there are some, I think, um, storm clouds on the horizon. I'm, I tend to be a little bit of a, I don't want to say glass half empty guy, but I always have to remind myself that um, we have opportunity. We've seen tremendous growth. You know, we, we focus on the public equities as well. Um, what Noah did with Echo Invest in and uh, in going doing a go private in um, in Warsaw is tremendous. We see a lot of opportunity there, 
Um, but we've also seen a tremendous growth both in private equity, real estate, as well as public securities. Um, the S&P index was up 29%, I think, year on year for last year. Uh, we're not going to see that same type of growth. We don't expect that same type of growth um, going forward this year. Having said that, I think there was something about interest rates and adjustment of interest rates. Um, I just saw this morning um, um, Jerome Powell, you know, if, uh, head of the U.S. Fed, coming on saying, you know, we might have to do another series of a round of easing uh, because we're not happy with the inflation rates and other things that we're seeing globally. Um, you know, we mentioned the viruses and you know coronavirus. I think that's a real potential issue right now for 2020 uh, because it will slow China down. China represents 70 percent of global GDP. So I just want to you know temper the discussion by saying. I love what I see. I think it's tremendous looking out on the, on the skyline here in Budapest. And we are, remind ourselves that it is a small market. Um, great opportunity, but also some caution. Thanks. Um, yeah, Luke. Just, just on, on South Korean capital, um, I think what's important to point out, this, this is in regards to FDI investment, I'm talking purely real estate, is that um, I think you're going to see a change. I mean, South Korean capital has been, uh, I would say, the biggest story in terms of new investors on the Central European market for the last two years. Um, but the feeling really is, if you if you hear what's happening in Korea, they're getting very nervous um, about their exposure in the real estate in Europe, with Central Europe being near the top of that list. Um, and and what we've heard is that. Well, there's still going to be investments into real estate. The idea would be that they're going to shift their focus towards a few things. One being forward sales. So this will be a change. They, they, they want to have a forward sale in the sense of it gives them time to then syndicate the investment back down to the major pension funds in Korea. Uh, currently, right now, there's anywhere between four to seven uh, Korean investments that we've heard of across Europe that are failing to syndicate these investments back down within Korea, meaning that they will likely have to sell uh, their investments within the next kind of six to 12 months. So within Korea, they're nervous about that. So they're trying to secure forward funding deals. Alternatively, they're going after uh, long tenancies with public institutions. Um, and they, they want, I mean, there was a deal in, in Brussels, I think, announced where it was a 1.3 billion euro deal, um, but it was because it was a 25 year lease to a government institution. Um, the, the days of them buying on a six year Walt uh, individual assets for 60, 70 million euros, I think, are probably going to go away fairly soon. And they're going to they're going to shift their appetite towards kind of larger syndicated deals where there's potentially less risk for them. So on the real estate side, I think I think there will be a marked shift. I think Asian capital is going to be important, but the South Korean story is going to change pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, interesting as well. And in London, people were talking about, uh, because of the situation in Latin America, that increasingly we should start to see far more Latin American capital beginning to look for a home in Europe as well. Um, no, I wanted to pick up with you because um, before in some of these discussions, we've, we've looked at the sort of maybe the lack of capital, um, regional capital, but also... Um, capital within Poland, and, and I was therefore really interested to see the, the deal that we've mentioned before here, um, because do, do you think that that's a, a, a simply an opportunity, or is it a growing sign of, of maturity in the market in terms of a, a, a more regional capital coming in and looking at opportunities across border within CE? I think all of those things. I mean, certainly we saw it as an opportunity. And just just to be precise, uh, Tom, we have not taken Echo private. So we acquired a controlling stake in Echo, a majority stake, and Echo remains listed on the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Um, I think there are a bunch of different levels to the question. And first of all, one of the things that's happened uh, in the region uh, post-crisis, uh, uh, basically, is that strong domestic players emerged in all of these markets, in the Czech Republic, in, in Slovakia, in, in Poland, in Hungary, who uh, can act as, as major investors. And I think um, that has happened domestically, and that, that was quite clear, I think, on the, on the slides that, that Kevin showed before, that there's a lot of domestic money buying product in the local markets, if it's in the form of uh, you know, real estate investment funds or, or private equity uh, types of, of, of investors. That's something that emerged over the last four to five years, I think, in a very, in a very visible and very uh, healthy way, because it provides a basis of investors who are comfortable in the local environment and are maybe a bit more able to measure what they're seeing 
in terms of market trends, also potentially in terms of political uh, developments or, or other, other ways, and that it's a deep base of capital, so it provides liquidity, I think, on a forward-looking basis as well. It's not gonna go away. Um, the second thing I think you're seeing is local or regional players in CE uh, with you know 20 or more years of experience starting to be sophisticated large players who are looking for the best opportunities as they come up. And uh, we obviously made a strategic decision that we wanted to step out of Hungary in addition to our activity in Hungary. So it certainly doesn't mean that we're you know reducing our activity here locally. Uh, but we, we had sufficient capital and I think a sufficient strategic view that we said it may make sense for us to look at opportunities outside of Hungary as well. We spent quite a bit of time and effort to figure out where we wanted to go. We identified Poland as the largest and in many ways uh, most sophisticated and most stable market in the region. And then we decided that what we really wanted to do as, as a company and for our strategic needs was invest in a strong platform. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to find the right one and at the end we found one that we feel really very strongly about is, is, is a very good perspective, uh, long-term perspective strategic investment for us. As a developer uh, in, the, in the residential and office space primarily with some retail as well. That said, um, we were in a competitive environment for the potential investments we looked at, and we were not competing uh, only, in fact, we were not competing at all against other CE investors. We were competing against big institutional international investors. So I think what you're seeing now, and this is going in multiple directions, is the local or regional investors being players in this market, but being players in this market alongside people from other places if it's Austria or Germany or the UK or the US, uh, as one of the potential uh, investors who have the capital to do it, who have the professionalism to do it, and have a certain view about how they wanna take things forward, which may be different than a US hedge fund, but that doesn't mean that the US hedge funds are not here, it just means that that's one additional element which has now come into play 30 years on to the, you know, to the changes. So I think from our point of view, coming back uh, specifically to wing in our investment, we view it as a long-term strategic investment, we view it as uh, something that we are in a position not only to acquire but to manage and hopefully to create value and, 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 and realize the synergies that exist in the region. And then beyond that, what I think is you will see this and you'll see this both in real estate and it's already apparent in other sectors as well where you'll have strong uh, local players, uh, be they banks or oil companies or airlines or, or real estate investors looking increasingly at the region as a whole and playing you know a role outside of their own borders. Okay, good. Interesting. Um, uh, Zinedra, I just wanted to, to pick up with you because you're obviously seeing the capital flows side from a different perspective because it's the more the sort of boutique, smaller um, kind of deals. Are you seeing an increasing range of capital? W what are you seeing? I just wanted to pick up actually on what Noah also said that I agree with everything, but I also see that we see that the domestic capital, which is very strong in, in fact, especially in Hungary, I think 74% of last year's transactions were, but correct me, Luke would know better probably, um, domestic capital driven, scares some away actually, and there is healthy uh, interest and new entrants looking to, to come into the market, but some just said we, we see too much activity and we're probably going to be out a bit. Of course, there's a difference between small ticket, big ticket, you know, who's interested in what, and on alternatives that Tom said, and on size matters, and, and who's looking at what. Um, I got an email just a couple of days ago, private equity company looking for 100 million to invest on, in alternatives, student housing. We don't really have those kind of products. I mean, very limited in Poland, yes, uh, to some degree. But, but alternatives, which we see as a very exciting, interesting product, not so much yet on the market in many areas. There could be interest for it, but we don't really have a market for it. So um, that and, could be something. And just drilling down into that a bit, does that mean that, that actually, so there's obviously money that's looking to come into student housing. Um, does that Big mean scale. it's... Mainly. <laughs> scale, that, uh, that's for sure. But does that mean that there's therefore a lot of potential for that product to be built? Um, is there, de is there de the demand for it in terms of uh, so. international students and mm -hmm. various things here in, in Hungary? Apparently there is demand and, and you know if the product was built there could be demand for the, the investment product as well and there is you know Hungary Budapest is a very very big city for students um, so but the products aren't quite there yet or the size the scale isn't there yet for the entrance I mean you have a couple of single assets and there are some more coming or BTRs but they're small 
um, and these guys want want big bigger platforms. I think I think one of the challenges we've seen watching kind of the student housing sector, mostly in Poland, but in some of the other markets, you're starting to see it is it's actually not easy to make money um, because the the prices that students can pay, even international students, um, your margins can get very thin, and and I think that. You're, you're going to see a lot of investors look at this model and, and then have to make the decision, okay, am I going to do student housing, which, which probably has more risk from an immediate profit perspective, maybe on the exit it's more interesting if you can build up scale, um, or am I going to do build to rent, or do I just do traditional BTS build to sell? And, and, and my feeling is actually, to be honest, I think you're going to see more developers looking at build to rent. Um, because it's it's a much easier process for them. There's less risk. There's arguably more steady cash flow and less management. I think the student housing, you have more complications in terms of government intervention. If the government here decides that they're going to build 300, even 600 units of student housing across the street from your development, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and, and that's not quite the same with... BTR. Um, so my guess is the student housing sector will continue to grow, but I would expect that developers are going to look way more towards build to rent uh, strategies because I just think they have enough cash. They maybe don't need to sell, um, but starting on a whole new product line with more risk on it might not be attractive. Okay. I agree with what, what you said, but uh, I think our market's not set up yet, our investors and our banks, for large scale BTRs. Um, you can't pre lease. Um, apartments, so it's got to be speculative developments. Private equity hates speculative um, developments, and uh, from a development point of view, most of our money comes from private equity companies. So, to buy land, um, greenfield, brownfield, um, and then uh, kind of take a punt on, uh, on, on a build to rent for resi is tough. That's why you know I, I think this market is going to be um, largely driven by more institutional core money um, that has a long-term view on the cities we operate in. So university cities, uh, for the most part, starting with the capitals, which we already see in Poland. So the Catellas of this world, the, the TAGs, they're, they're going to be funding developers. Um, and these things are going to be mostly equity funded um, uh, for long-term investments. Uh, I, I don't see, you know, the, the, the Starwoods maybe getting into, or uh, um, yeah, Blackstone's TPGs getting into, uh, um, speculative developments, residential in Warsaw, Budapest, uh, you know, 70, 100 unit building with the idea of ramping this up over five years. Okay, good. Um, questions just come in as well on, uh, I'll just return briefly to the, to the capital side. Um, do you see Scandinavian money moving into the region? So thank you for that. And I forgot to say that if you also like a question that somebody else um, has done, you can tick like, and then it moves up to the top of my phone. Um, so Scandinavian money, are we, have, we, have we seen it? Are we seeing more of it? I spent a couple of years, a couple of few years in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, we were a listed uh, um, shopping center owner, about 5 billion euros. Um, I think uh, Kevin pointed out, C 17 billion um, transactions. Sweden is 15. Um, there is enough product, enough scale, enough size in Northern Europe um, uh, for the local investors. And it's mostly a locally driven market and all the Ilmarinens of this world and so on. Large institutions um, are not here. Uh, maybe they're, we don't see them because they're through the international uh, managers or in the background, but um, not, nothing to speak of in terms of direct yet, aside from you know the Skanskas and so on, and uh, but not uh, the, the big guys that are up there. Just a, the uh, the residential portfolio uh, that Blackstone just sold uh, this a few weeks ago was actually Heimstaden, which is a Swedish capital, uh, so the 1.3 billion, and otherwise it's just really small pockets of Norwegian, uh, Norwegian, maybe a little bit of Finnish capital there, but um, otherwise, uh, but yeah, that big 1.3 billion is but very fresh. Right, okay, interesting. Um, ju I just wanted to pick up on some of the, some of the broader trends also that, that came out of some of the other sessions, um, ESG, wellness, um, sustainability, all moving heavily up the um, up the, in, in terms of the investor's view and the occupier's view. Um, how much of the, is that having an influence, um, particularly in these markets? Do you see that as a, as a growing influence? Uh, I don't know if the question was addressed to it me. It can be 20 yeah, Very much so. I mean, I think that both in terms, 
primarily, I would say, first and foremost, driven by occupiers. I mean, be they the people buying or renting your apartments, or be they the office tenants coming into your buildings. I think the focus um, on modern office space in the last really five years or so has undergone a dramatic transformation. When you talk about um, uh, HQ buildings and build-to-suit buildings, which we've done quite a few of, um, th they're now HR-driven projects, right? They're, they're, they're people who are really thinking about how their employees feel in the space, how they interact in the space, um, and actually how their office or workspaces, if it's not office, uh, will be a, a tool for them to attract talent. As we see, you know, the flip side of the, of the unemployment pictures, which we were shown before, is that there is a real competition for, for the let's say the more dynamic elements, you know, you look at the overall unemployment figures and you see numbers for the country which include agriculture and manufacturing and a lot of other things. When you start to look in, in the capital city markets, you will see an even more difficult situation, I think. A lot of upward pressure. A lot of upward pressure also driven in the Central European markets by the fact that we're not only competing in the local market, but certainly, you know, people are going to work in London or Frankfurt or, or maybe some of them are coming home from London this week, but are going, uh, you know, in, into other markets where, where they also can make more money and have a very high quality of life. So, I mean, I think that, that there's a real competition for attractive workspace and in today's uh, marketplaces, that's not only a function of salaries. It's also a function of the work environment and, and how people function. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, the environmental profile of the buildings we build, again, that has become both for occupiers and for investors a key piece. Um, they want to, as, as good corporate citizens, uh, uh, you know, be in space that, that's environmentally sound. But that said, and I, I always say this, it's also as a landlord, as a building owner, it's good business, right? So as a rule, uh, 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 a building which is, which is uh, uh, constructed with environmental um, awareness in the planning stages will also be a building that's more efficient to operate. Uh, and so while you also need to tick some boxes to get the BREEAM or the LEED or whatever the certification is, I think it's very important to see that over the long term life, life cycle of a building, you, you should have a more efficient building which is good for you and good for the tenants and also good for the environment. So I really think that there are a lot of pieces in play here and, and, and we see that very much so. And I think the sophistication of these markets in that regard has, has, uh, has, has increased dramatically. So somebody asked me last night, you know, where are we in terms of comparison of, of building quality to, to uh, Western Europe? And I would say today, in a lot of our new buildings, I think it's very comparable. I don't, I don't go to Frankfurt and feel like I'm in much better space than I am here. No, I mean, that is, it's interesting to, to see that, uh, actually, as well, when I travel around, the, that what was a disparity, if you were traveling maybe 10 years ago, um, is much, much less so now, and you look at it and go, wow, that's... <laughs> Um, just to Noah's point, uh, I agree with what you said, um, but it also differs in between the cities in Central Europe. So the expectations are the same in terms of the, the, the space, but in, you know, in Budapest and maybe in Warsaw, you're more likely as a developer land to get rewarded for the quality that you're providing. But if you look at you know, Krakow or Wroclaw and some of the secondary cities in Poland where there's unlimited supply of land and there's a huge pipeline, um, you as a developer are taking this on, on your own, uh, you know, if somebody's sitting in Frankfurt or, uh, you know, London deciding where they're going to locate their shared service center, um, they want all these bells and whistles, and, and rightly so, but there you're less likely to get paid for it, frankly speaking. So uh, we've been developing crack for the last, you know, 12, 14 years. Uh, we have eight office buildings and another two under construction. If you look at headline rents, they haven't really budged that much on the new deals, right? But the fit out has, has, has gone up. Um, so inevitably, you know, I think technologies are changing as well. So um, speaking to a contractor, somebody told me some, some scary statistic. The average age of their workers on site is pushing high 40s. Um, and the, there isn't, you know, a lot of youth that are looking to getting into uh, putting rebars and pouring concrete out of school. So they're looking at more prefab, um, which, you know, first it's going to, you know, mitigate this risk, but hopefully lower our costs as well to build. Um, so we can put all these uh, fancy uh, technologies into our buildings and still make a decent development profit. But from your point of view, have you definitely seen a large change in terms of demands for, you know, well-being as well as sustainability and all of those aspects? I mean, one of the interesting things that that came up in a couple of the sessions was the change from that it's very difficult for brands to show 
to demonstrate their credentials in terms of sustainability and green, apart from doing it with their HQ uh, or their buildings. So that, that that demand side that Noah talked about there is, is really coming through. Are you, are you seeing that in terms of increased demand for wellness for all of the, is, is the number of things you're expected to build into it increasing? Absolutely, uh, but just to, you know, you know, we're just amongst real estate professionals here. If you look at the BREM LEED certificates in Eastern Europe, honestly, it's not that hard to get, right? So to your point that our buildings are not that, you know, for many years they've been worse in Western Europe, but if you look at to, to, to Canada or the US where the floor plates of a building can be 5,000, 7,000 square meters and half the people don't have access to direct daylight here, just by virtue of the legislation, you can, you tick 80% of the boxes because our standard, go, you know, from the get-go are so much higher. Obviously, that, that, that improved over the years. What's changing now is the wellness of the occupiers as well. So, and interestingly, that is sometimes contradictory to the, the BREM certificate. So the, the occupier wants more air, more light, um, higher quality materials, which sometimes require more energy, um, more kind of unused space, which um, actually might undermine the, 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 the energy efficiency of the building. Interesting. Um, Zineda, do you want to... Just to um, go back to a little bit to my previous um, hat, which I had on working for a large regional international developer on key account management for large corporate occupiers, I can definitely confirm all of what's been said that uh, the tenants, there is a very strong tenant drive and an increased expectations in terms of quality, but luckily also, which can be clearly witnessed throughout the years, and I've been working for developers or with developers various types for 15 years, developed, worked on uh, building assets, and the, the quality and the amount of thought and, and quality that goes into these new buildings is, is incredibly has gone up compared to what we did and how much time we spent 10 years ago on building a building just to kind of tick the basic boxes, lease it up, and, and the next one can come. And now it's, it's a lot of thought and value and design that goes into it because clients and CRE professionals drive it. And actually there's a very interesting report, um, I think it's 220 Outlook on CRE published by Deloitte, and it says, well, real estate, of course, is location, 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 but it's also location experience and analytics in the future. So the CRE professionals of the corporates are, are driving the demand for smart building, buildings, healthy buildings, um, technological solutions. Um, so, so it's, and, it's, and they are expecting rising commitment, investment in these areas. And um, clearly these can be witnessed on this market. And these guys are, are delivering the projects uh, in line with that because that's what's expected. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that have come in, thank you for those, um, and drill down a little bit into the sectors. Uh, office was obviously one of the key sectors, and you can see a lot of office development here. Um, but we've got a couple of things coming in which are both about um, uh, kind of shared, uh, I suppose, co-living, co-working, that, that sort of shared trend. Um, so do you see... Um, do you see attracting companies such as Quarters, um, but also then WeWork type of shared, you know, office space? Do you see that as helping create more finance products um, and more investors for the build to rent suit? So if you look at that sort of care, you know, co-living sort of space, whether that's an interesting area to look at. Um, but also then looking at the trend for flexible office space, um, how viable is it here? Um, especially given the BPO focus of Poland and Hungary. So a couple of things, one around that sort of, both around that kind of shared, shared space idea, but one in residential and one in, in office. Anyone can pick that up. Well, I think um, actually on this panel one or, or two years ago, uh, we were together with Hubert Abt, who's here somewhere, um, talking about, you know, what is the shared office concept and how does it impact? And from our point of view, um, we're real estate developers and we build for tenants who occupy our space. So we're gonna rent to somebody uh, and they'll have a fit out requirement and they'll, you know, when we'll try to make a competitive package and then we'll rent out their space. Um, and uh, we have seen a big change in how people use our space and that's also true for big corporate occupiers. So even, you know, a telecom um, or an Ericsson here across the river, who are big corporate occupiers who are taking long leases on our on our on full buildings, are still creating a lot more flexible space within their buildings to allow their employees the type of flexibility to come together in teams, to hot desk, to you know there there are more people working in the buildings than there are workstations. Um, so we see all of those trends, but from our point of view, 
what we really see is the quality of a tenant. Now, a year ago, we work was the tenant you really wanted to have in your building, and um, today that's somewhat less so, which doesn't mean that that phenomenon is going away. It just means that that um, uh, we still look at the you know at 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 at. at, at, at at a tenant and say, is this somebody you know who's who's a who's a, who has sufficient equity and sufficient you know is is a good long term long term uh, uh, tenant for us? In terms of the shared living spaces, again, it's something around the rent resi for rent concept. That this is one way of using space. It's one way of giving it out. Um, the same as student housing. At the end of the day, if I'm in the hotel business, then I need a hotel operator. Either I need to run it myself, and I need to rent out those rooms to generate my income stream. And that's the same for all of these other residential-based pro products. If you're selling beds, you're selling beds on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a, on a semester basis. But again, as a real estate developer, at the end of the day, what you're looking for is how how will your space be occupied and who will pay you to occupy it? And I think that remains the same irrespective of the fact that there are big changes in how we as consumers make use of cars, make use of living space, make use of office space. Um, the equation for us hasn't changed dramatically because we still need to be able to finance our buildings and we need to see cash flow coming off them and so we need to figure out how that's going to be generated. Good. Um, and from, from your point of view, Tom, do, do you... Are you building in the idea that there will be a certain amount of flexible space within offices as you're developing them? Um, is, is that set to grow? What's your sense of that? I think so. Uh, I think it's actually great news for us that you know, there are co-working occupiers interested in our, in our markets. Um, because otherwise, what you know, the, the, the large occupiers, um, we see that more now, they're trying to implement flexible leases within your building as well. So if somebody takes large space, they want to be able to ramp up or ramp down. Um, so, you, you know, on, on the face of it, you might have a, full, a sense of security. They have a, 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 I don't know, a built to suit. But if somebody insists on being able to give you back 25% of the space because the projects that they work on are relatively short term, and they want to be able to hire and let people go quickly, the fact that you can have a, um, a co-working occupier in your space, they can be a safety valve for that operator as well. So, you know, we have them um, in, in all our developments now, or we will, um, and we use that as a benefit when we speak to other tenants, that if you need to ramp up, by the way, there's going to be temps in the building that, you know, will be able to accommodate you. Okay, yeah. good. That's interesting. Just one follow-up comment on that. I think it is a trend, and I think um, it is a function of which should be sustainable, the fact that these economies, the Central European economies, are likely to have a better growth profile in the coming in the coming years than Western Europe, particularly the bad parts, or let's say the, the struggling parts of Western Europe. They're not bad parts, they're good parts. But um, I had the, uh, because I had not encountered that in Budapest yet, I was in Krakow in an office building and went down to the cafeteria for lunch, and, and the people around me were speaking Spanish and Italian. And I said, what is this? And they said, well, actually, these are better job prospects than they have at home, and people are coming here. Furthermore, they love the quality of life in the city, and, and, and it's, a, it's a major element of what's going on. So I think it is something we will continue to see. It, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, that would have been inconceivable. You came here for an adventure and for a different thing. Now there's an actual comparison where it may make sense. The good news is that quality educated labor Morgan Stanley does their mathematical modeling, um, two buildings up the road here, uh, is still dramatically cheaper than it would be in Western European or overseas markets. So there's still a real advantage to coming here for these kinds of smart, uh, 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 let's say, activities that, that, a, that a modern economy should be based on. It's, it's funny because I made an active decision uh, my wife made a decision to come to Europe, actually, or back to Europe. It wasn't my decision. Um, uh, but her home is Vienna. And um, I don't want to be critical of Austria or Vienna. It's a wonderful country and wonderful city. Um, but I made an active decision, personally, as an American, to relocate uh, myself, um, my citizenship, my uh, tax residency, and other activities to Budapest, and I'm in the process of that transition right now, just as a personal anecdote. Um, for me, it's interesting because I was back in New York um, in December, and I was visiting with um, 
international tax consultants and they, you know, I was describing what I was doing in Budapest and it was sort of like a dog, you know, twisting its neck. And I said, like, what are you doing? Um, and I said, well, you know, we're, we're setting up a, a office. We set up a, a, a trust structure. We're doing things that are Hungarian focused um, because I have to be in the region and I choose to be here. I don't have to be here. Um, and they thought that was sort of an interesting, this is the first time we ever heard of American going to Hungary to set up a stru structure, um, investment structure and what have you. And uh, so for me personally, it, it made a lot of sense. And I know you posted the, the tax structure, or I, b I believe it was uh, you, Robert, um, you know, the 9% corporate, the 15% personal income tax. We'll see how it all sort of washes out uh, as an American citizen, because uh, unfortunately, as an American, we, we serve a, a higher authority of the uh, <laughs> IRS um, globally. Uh, <laughs> but regardless, I think from a cost perspective of employees and what we're doing, setting up a small office here, not elsewhere in Western Europe, um, it's an active effort um, because I believe in what is going on here and the cost side of it. Um, just one point um, on the cost side of it, also on the construction side of it, some of my clients that are developers say it costs just as much to develop and the buildings are just as good here in Budapest or Bucharest or, or Warsaw as they are in Frankfurt or Dusseldorf or what have you. So there is a cost pressure um, that is more difficult um, to, to face here as well going forward uh, from a real estate perspective. And that's something that um, rents have to catch up to some extent because the demands are there for the quality of the building, that's for sure. And the quality of the buildings are great here. The question is, can the rents catch up to where they are in other parts of Europe? That's all. I mean, let's, let's pick that up. Um, just, just, Luke, in terms of the opportunity for, for rent increases, um, how, how do you see that? Because, I mean, there's an interesting topic that there's been at some of the others also that as real estate moves more to being a service and we get used to a, a new life in terms of interest rates, that actually the only way to, to add value really is in terms of the, the rental increase. So what's the sense of that? Yeah, so if, if you're looking at rental rates, you've got to look at it market by market across Central Europe because I think each country is slightly different. I would say that... Um, the rents here in Budapest have increased uh, over the last, I guess it would be 12, 18 months. Um, there's a question as to whether it could continue. Um, I think at some point it has to. If, if tenants are demanding the additional services, construction prices are going up, at some point developers have to pass this on to, to tenants. Um, and the market the way that it is, I think it can absorb that. I mean, we've seen it in Prague now where we've seen uh, rental rates on kind of your prime buildings move up fairly dramatically, whereas traditionally prog rents were always flat. They were somewhere sitting around 20, 21. Uh, you're now seeing some of the, the better buildings being able to push for 23, 24, which sounds like only a euro increase, but in terms of percentage value, it's significant. Um, and, and that's because tenants, again, it goes back to the question we were talking about before, tenants want to be in the best location that keeps their employees happy. And I believe that they will continue to pay for that if you have the right asset. If you look at real estate as a percentage of most companies' P&L, uh, yes, it's significant, but you're looking at usually below 10%, in some cases, 5 or 6% of the total P&L. So a, a move on the rental line actually doesn't make much of a difference, but it, it is a function of the market has to kind of make that adjustment, and, and landlords have to be willing to take a bit of risk up front uh, to, to maybe have their space stay vacant for a little while longer. Um, but again, I, I do think it goes back to having the right building and, and having right now in a tight rental market, um, you're able to probably have tenants be willing to pay a little bit more for the right space. Okay, good. Um, and just, just if we run quickly through some of the, just, just a sort of brief overview of how you see the sectors as well. Um, so look, in terms of, you, you've obviously got a view across the whole of it. So where do we see hotels? Where do we see industrial Do, do I logistics? have to talk about retail? You, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, actually, you know what? I, I was in Poland, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago at uh, another event um, that Richard was at as well. And in Poland, obviously, retail is an even bigger story. And um, the, the consensus, and this is probably one of the first times I've seen this, is, is that uh, retail could see probably an uplift over the next 12, 18 months. And the reason for this is that uh, there's still a lot of value if you have a good retail asset. 
And if you're in the right location and you have good footfall and you have the right amenities, um, in some cases you could argue that things have been uh, probably discounted a little bit too heavily. Uh, so I do think that retail could see uh, an increase. And I'm more talking shopping centers. I think retail parks, um, interest is probably at an all-time high. Um, I, I think people look at that as a very defensive asset. Um, it, it's very sticky in terms of you're, you're going after usually a catchment area uh, that doesn't have a lot of alternatives. And, and if you do the right retail park, it also becomes defensive. Somebody else doesn't want to step in. So retail, I think, will be an interesting space to watch. I don't think it's all doom and gloom unless you're in the UK, in which case that's an entirely different story. But within Central Europe, um, I actually think there's opportunities in retail. Industrial logistics, nothing much has changed. Everybody wants to buy, not many people are selling. I think you will see some larger portfolios trade, and that's where I think the market's gonna go, is you're gonna see some of the bigger developers offload major portfolios uh, and probably try and capitalize themselves to go do another wave of expansion and development. So uh, I think that'll be the dominant story, is, is large transactions and portfolios on the industrial logistics side. Um, on offices, it's it's more of the same. Um, I really think that it's going to continue to be the dominant investment sector. Um, it's a supply question in terms of whether or not people will be selling. Uh, I think in a lot of markets, obviously, demand is, is far outstripping supply. Um, and the challenge is trying to get investors that are holding product, uh, as Kevin was pointing out, find them something to buy so that they're willing to sell. And that's, that's really going to be the story of this year. OK, good. Um, we're coming up to the to the end of the session here. Um, there's a couple of things I just wanted to deal with in terms of future proofing um, today's new developments as technology changes quickly. Um, you know, so for example, will we need parking spaces if there's shared transportation? Um, so it's how much of that in terms of the development side are you sort of having to chase and think about where you're going to be in the next 10 years with, with items like parking and those kinds of things? I think the question is not only developers, uh, but also to authorities, mm -hmm. right? So zoning has to catch up with that as well. So if you have a, you know, kind of archaic parking requirements and other sorts of uh, uh, restrictions that are put at developers, I mean, we can, you know, we're ready to accommodate all these technologies, but uh, ultimately it's, you know, there's a, a mayor and a city council that has to give you approval as well for that. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of the buildings here have too much parking spaces, and it's true across centuries in Europe, right? I mean, in Warsaw, what's happening is, uh, you know, many of the, the office building locations, they're in, they don't need any, actually, right? But uh, the zoning is such that you need to go five, six stories underground, and uh, three quarters of them are empty. Uh, right, it's hard to get to and so on. So it's, uh, I think we're easier to convince, we're convinced and we're trying to accommodate, but uh, ultimately it's also, you know, what our, uh, our honorable partners in the uh, administration think as well. Okay, good. Um, so last couple, of, last couple of points from me. We're obviously at the beginning of a new net decade, not just a new year. Um, so, uh, and I'm not gonna, it's, it's for you to decide whether there's anything you want to contribute at this, but are there any particular themes, whether that's uh, innovation, technology, um, sustainability, are there any big trends that you think are gonna be the most influential ones for your business um, for the next decade? Anybody want to tackle that? Well done, Noah, I like that. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm, I'm just <laughs> going to preach to the choir a little bit. I mean, I think that in looking at how we've positioned ourselves and what's going on, I think we feel very strongly that we're in the right region. I think this will be the best part of Europe um, in lots of ways in, in the next decade. And uh, uh, for those of us who are in a position to uh, create value through through our work and through our companies, it'll be an exciting time. And I think, um, you know, you're in, a, you're in a, a long cycle, let's say, in terms of starting at 1990 and looking back, and then in a shorter cycle from wherever you want to date, you know, 2015 or so, uh, the resurgence of the markets. And and there will be, I think, a further transformation. And barring, you know, unforeseeable events, which can always happen, and there are lots of them, uh, and they were up on the, on the first slide, I think, of the presentation, uh, it will be a economically and in terms of the dynamic that's going on in the societies here, a, a, a good time to be in Central Europe. Okay, good. Um, on trends, 
on trends, I think technology will have a major impact in the decade ahead on how, you know, on the, in, in the industry as a general, how buildings are built or assets are used. Uh, and it's also driven by the users, the new generation. And I don't think we can even imagine yet how it will impact our industry. And it's coming, it's happening, we see it to some degree. Um, there's a lot of noise on the market as well. There's a lot of noise out there related, related to this field. But I think technology um, itself will have a huge impact on our industry um, as a whole to come. Um, but what's your sense of, of where best to invest? I'll just take that. If I can, um, uh, we're looking very much at the publicly listed space. We think it's undervalued compared to private real estate. It's one that there's a displacement there um, that uh, we, we think is, is a real opportunity. So um, some of these companies are trading at 10, 15, 20% discount to NAV, net up, uh, asset value. And in most cases, um, properties in the same markets are trading it above um, market value when they trade uh, in markets like Germany and others. So I, I tend to agree with Noah very quickly on the region. I ran away from emerging markets because I spent 20 plus years running around the globe trying to chase the return and convince investors uh, evangelizing that places like Hungary and Czech Republic and Poland are just the greatest places to invest. And they always came back and said, give us more of Germany. Although we don't want to pay for it, give us more of Germany. Today, I think, um, you know, with returns at, at you know, yields at 2.8, 3.2, 3 3.5%, it's just not interesting for these global investors to continue to try to chase the same asset that everyone else is chasing. So I do think that there is real opportunity in that regard, and that's kind of why I've, I've turned back to this region and said, you know, with 5, 6, 6.5%, 6 people are making real money. Uh, retail, our client is making 8%. Um, basketed returns across a two billion uh, retail portfolio. They've got a 150 million um, a footfall annually and they love retail parks. It makes them a lot of money. It's cheap to build and they make a lot of money off the tenants that are renting at 10 euros a square meter at a retail park versus 25, 30 on high street. Thanks. We're optimistic on the university cities in Central Europe. Uh, good demographics, despite the overall negative demographics in the region. Um, quite significant urbanization taking place in Poland. Um, many cities in you know, between the uh, up to 100,000 uh, population, they're losing population. Those people are moving young people to the bigger cities, good universities. Um, first time in our histories in these countries, they're, um, they're immigrant countries as well. That poses challenges as well, how to integrate. Um, newcomers, uh, we've always been exporters of our people. Um, for the first in a long time, it's the other way around. Poland, you have a million and a half Ukrainians um, that are largely driving this, uh, the economy as well. They're going to stay um, just due to cultural reasons here as well. Um, a lot of uh, foreign languages being spoken in Budapest. Um, so I think that's going to drive the office um, sector and the residential as well, which we're quite optimistic about. Okay, great. So I, I know I should answer something in Central Europe, but um, I would actually say I'd buy distressed retail in the UK, if you can find the right location, city center. Um, I think you've got a currency play there. Uh, I also think just in general, that market's been so beat up that if you've got long-term money, um, that could be very interesting. So I, I would say, if I that would be my thing if I'm looking European. If I'm looking within Central Europe, um, I'm still a fan of Romania. I really like Hungary, don't get me wrong, I think it's a great long-term uh, play, but I think Romania, you've still got some room in terms of compression of yields, um, and there's still, I think, some very good assets that it's under-traded as a market versus all of its comparables in Central Europe. So I still think for 2020, uh, there's still some room in Romania if you're looking for more of a, a short-term lift on your, on your equity. No. Well, I guess, um, to the best of my knowledge, Trigrounded is not for sale, so I, I can't say that. Um, uh, uh, I think we, you know, pretty clearly have demonstrated that our view is that, that right now, if I were to choose one thing, I would say office and CEE, and obviously we've made a pretty clear statement that we think that's in Poland and Hungary. Super. Yeah, so Poland and Hungary, and um, yeah, offices. Always, but you know, it would be interesting to see more alternatives. And there's healthy, healthy appetite and demand for hotels and hospitality, and the alternative sector. So, okay, great, thank you.